Hello and welcome to the 2020 GHSA umpire camp. This year we are going to cover knowing the distance. Distance is important both on and off the field and knowing the distance in today's day and age is even more important. Today we're going to cover a review of the 2019 rules, the new 2020 rules. We're going to dive into mechanics, the changes in kickoff mechanics, as well as goal line mechanics. And then we're going to finish up the presentation with Corona and the ball. As a reminder, after the presentation, you'll be directed to take a test. Uh, the test will come directly from this presentation and we will go over most of the test questions along the way. So let's jump into the 2019 rules review. Everybody will remember last year one of the rule changes was redefining the requirements for a legal scrimmage kick formation. Well, what exactly did that mean? Uh, it, actually, it actually simplified how we officiate. Now, we're not worried about having seven on the line of scrimmage to have a legal formation. To have a legal formation, we just have to have five numbered 50 to 79. And then in addition to the 550 to 79, typically our, our line of scrimmage, our linemen, we can have no more than four players in the backfield. Yep, that's right. They can play with one, two, three, but no more than four players in the backfield and five guys, number 50 to 79 on the line, line of scrimmage. If they don't have 550 to 79 on the line, line of scrimmage, it's an illegal formation for illegal numbering. It's a live ball foul. It's a five yard penalty. Well, the rationale behind this, again, as you can read, legal scrimmage formation now requires at least five offensive players on the line of scrimmage with no more than four in the back. Uh, so the rationale is to make it easier for, for us to officiate offensive line of scrimmages and offensive formations. Well, let's take a look at this example out of the Reddings book, example 313. Team A lines up with their normal offensive team, but with only 10 players. The formation includes the regular four backs. The missing player is in A, a tight end, number 88, or in B, a tackle, number 76. Again, they only have 10 players. One of them is missing. In A, the formation is legal because there are no more than four players in the backfield and at least five players wearing jerseys, jerseys number 50 to 79 on the scrimmage line. In B, it's a live ball foul for an illegal formation because there are only four players wearing jersey numbered 50 to 79 on the scrimmage line. So I hope that as an umpire, one of the progressions that you use is counting the 550 to 79 offensive linemen on every single down. I know last year I was working a game, um, beginning of the game, team came out, counted my 5 to 50 to 79. But in my 5 to 50 to 79, I had a, a right guard who was number 82. I looked all around the field, left and right. I did not see another number 50 to 79. Flagged it, penalized him, notified the coach to why he was being penalized. Um, he was at all, didn't understand why, uh, and sent his player back out there. So for two plays in a row, they were penalized. At that point in time, he wanted to call a timeout, argue why he was being penalized. Uh, after further conversation and a rules clarification, 
he was good to go and we didn't have that problem anymore. So let's watch this video. Um, here we have uh, offense formation coming to the line of scrimmage. Let's go ahead and play this. Here we have a pass to what appears to be, play it again, the left tackle. Let's get this queued up one more time. So if we look at it, our left tackle is, I believe he's number seven or number nine. Um, so although he's lined up in a left tackles position, now we have to define whether he is eligible by position, okay? Uh, is he covered up? Is there somebody outside of him on the line of scrimmage? And then in addition to that, where are my other five linemen 50 to 79. I have a left guard who meets that qualification. My center, my right guard, my right tackle do. So there's four. So I have a fifth guy that I have to find that should be numbered 50 to 79. So now I'm looking left and right to determine, do I have this guy out there on the field? Well, if you notice to the left side of the the screen. We actually have a big guy, pretty big guy going out for a pass. Let's watch this from a different angle. <clears throat> so again, you can see to the left of the screen, number 15 going in motion. There's no other players on the line of scrimmage. So our position player lined up at left tackle is actually a receiver or a tight end, whatever you want to call him but there is nobody on outside of him on the line of scrimmage. So he's eligible by both number and by position. Our left guard, our center, right guard and right tackle make up the four 50 to 79 interior linemen. If you look to the right hand side in a slot position, you'll see number 50 who's lined up on the line of scrimmage. This constitutes a legal formation. What's in question in this play if number 50, in fact, went downfield where he became an ineligible player downfield? Uh, the crew calling this game, in fact, made that call saying he was, in fact, in, an ineligible player downfield. For us, and what I want to bring out of this clip is, again, the importance of recognizing and looking on each play are 550 to 79. As an umpire, we need to determine, we needed to recognize that 50 was in fact out there. He was the fifth guy. He was on the line of scrimmage. So if I see somebody that's numbered with the linesman's number in a slot position, I'm gonna pay special and close attention to him to see what he does during that play. Next rule change of 2019 involved the 40 second play clock. Um, for me, the 40 second play clock was a good change. It helped the speed and to speed up the, uh, the game. I hope it did the same for you. Well, what about the rule in the past about tripping the runner? Tripping the runner in the past um, was legal. He was the only player on the field that could be tripped. Uh, now it is illegal to trip a runner. Tripping, and what we're looking for, is the use of a lower leg or foot to obstruct an opponent below the knee. Carries a 15 yard penalty and it is a personal foul on the defense. Next rule change from 2019 involves illegal, illegal kicking and batting. That penalty 
was reduced from 15 yards to 10 yards. Let's take a look at a film clip of an illegal kick. And a snap on a punt play, goes to the ground. Kicker feels like he has no other alternative but to kick it out of the back of the end zone. In the past, uh, that would be a 15 yard penalty. And now it's a 10 yard penalty. This right here with him kicking it out of the back of the end zone incorporates a different set of circumstances. All right, what about the horse collar tackle? In the past, in order to have a horse collar tackle, the runner would have to be grabbed by the inside of the jersey or inside of the jersey plus the shoulder pads and pulled down backwards or to the side. It could only involve one tackler and it, he would have to be brought down backwards. Well, they've changed this just a little bit to include grabbing the name plaque area of the jersey. So no longer does he have to get him on the inside, but he could get him on the outside of the jersey. Everything else stays the same, where it has to be a single tackle and he has to be pulled to the side or backwards. Take a look at this clip. The quarterback's looking to pass, he doesn't have anybody open. So he's going to decide to scramble out. As he does, the defender pursues him and grabs him either by the name area of the jersey or does get him a little bit on the inside but pulls him down. Uh, this is a good call for a horse collar. Remember, you can have a horse collar that starts inbounds and is carried out of bounds, as well as a horse collar that could happen in the end zone or out of bounds. Well, that's our 2019 rule changes. Uh, let's take a look at the 2020 Federation rule changes. Not many here, but a few. Let's uh, make sure we're all on the same page as we get ready for the 2020 season. Defining team designating representative for penalty decisions. Well, so what this is saying in this rule change is that the head coach can select somebody on his staff, an offensive coordinator or a defensive coordinator, or whoever he wants to, um, to call timeouts. Um, and in addition to that, he can make decisions on penalties. Uh, so if there is a penalty, you could go to this coach and it does not have to be the head coach and he could say, yes, this I want to accept this penalty, or no, I want to decline this penalty. Uh, he has to do this prior to the game. And then he has to notify the referee that he's designating somebody to uh, make these decisions and for his on his behalf. Well, if you read the rule, it goes on to say that this person um, will stay in place during the duration of the game. But there's a clause that says that if something were to happen to this coach, that the head coach could designate a second coach to take over for him. So this, you know, if let's, let's say the head coach designates the offensive coordinator to make penalty decisions and at halftime or before halftime, he's sick or he gets hurt and he has to leave the stadium. Second half of the game, the head coach wants to designate the defensive coordinator. Upon conference with the referee, um, this could be approved, and the defensive coordinator could be the coach for the second half to um, make these decisions. Next rule change for 2020 has to do with halftime intermission. And the rule change here says that if there's a couple minutes to go in the second quarter, in fact, three minutes or less in the second quarter, and there's an interruption in the game, typically it's going to be for lightning or weather delay. Um, 
So let's say there's a minute and a half to go in the second quarter, and we have lightning, and we have to leave the field. We're off the field for 30 minutes. Everything's okay. We come back out, and we finish up that minute and 30 seconds, and we go into halftime. Well, the referee can go to both head coaches, and by mutually agreeing, we can shorten the halftime to 10 minutes. Um, the question is, once we have a shortened halftime, whatever it's agreed upon by those coaches, when we come back out, out, of, out of halftime, do we still have to have the mandatory three-minute warm-up period? And the answer to that question is yes. Even if you shorten halftime, you're still going to take the three-minute mandatory warm-up period. Well, next we have the 40-second play clock. It's been clarified. And this really is uh, a clarification in regards to a defense or defensive player who um, is injured. And in the past, uh, I hate to say it, but sometimes a coach may tell a defensive player to fake an injury in order to stop the clock. And then in the past, we would start that clock on the 25 second. Uh, now that player could be injured and we might have an official's timeout, but we're not going to take away any time from the offensive team and we will still uh, honor them with 40 seconds uh, coming out of that injury. 25 second play clock. Anytime we have a legal free kick or a legal kick, excuse me, uh, and we are awarding a new series of downs, the play clock will be set to 25 seconds. Simple enough. Well, here's, a, here's one that's a little bit different from the past. It involves disconcerting act foul. And what exactly is that? You know, although not called often or often enough, there are times where a defensive player would bark cadence signals out in an attempt to have either that center snap the ball, false start, or one of the linemen false start. Well, that was illegal. And in the past, that foul was unsportsmanlike and carried a 15 yard penalty. Well, they've changed that and now they're classifying it as a disconcerting act foul. And the penalty is only going to carry a five yard penalty. I guess they felt that 15 yard and sportsman line for that was a little bit harsh. And um, we're going to try to equal out the playing field and only make it a five yard penalty. Here's a big one. Everybody needs to remember this. In the past, you had to be under center uh, take, to take a hand to hand snap and spike the ball in order to stop the clock. That's a little bit different this year. You could have a quarterback in shotgun formation, take that snap, has to be a direct snap, can't touch the ground, spike the ball, has to go immediately forward into the, excuse me, to the ground, and it would be a legal play where he could spike the ball and the, and the clock would stop. Well, those are our rule changes for 2020. Um, very few. That's good. We don't need to be changing the rules uh, every year, a lot of rules. In addition to the rule changes, our 2020 points of emphasis are sportsmanship. Sportsmanship should always be a point of emphasis. Intentional grounding, of course, because of that rule change, now we need to pay attention to intentional grounding um, and ineligibles downfield and line of scrimmage formation. Those are all points of emphasis. Well, let's look at some of the mechanics changes going into the 2020 season. Uh, the first one that we're going to discuss is kickoff mechanics. Yes, our kickoff mechanics are going to change both for six and seven man mechanics. Changes this year? Well, we are going to go from covering uh, our traditional man coverage to a zone coverage. 
if you'll remember in the past, depending if you're working on a six or seven man crew as an umpire, you were first responsible for the kicker. We'll still have that responsibility. But then after that, you were responsible for typically the players closest next to the kicker. Well, that's going to change. We're not going to be responsible and have to follow those players all the way down the field. Well, when we look at kickoffs, a couple things to remember is get off the sideline. Uh, our mechanic doesn't have us sitting on the sideline after a free kick is made uh, in his way. Get off the sideline and start to make your way down the field. Well, what are you looking for during the return? And we'll talk about that more in detail when we start to watch a little of these films. Uh, what about once the kick is ended? Well, once the kick is ended, let's make sure that we're setting up our referee in the proper position and direction. We're getting a new ball, typically a ball from the opposing team, getting that kicking ball off the field getting everybody set up and ready to go as speedy as we can. So again, change from man coverage to zone for our typical kickoffs. You see that in the mechanics manual, pages 41 to 43. So let's look at six man mechanics. Six man mechanics um, on free kicks, we're res still responsible for the kicker. We will still line up on the kicking side, kicking, kicking team side of the field. Um, but what's going to change is instead of watching the players next to the kicker, after the kick is away and the kicker has been afforded his protection and we've looked for all the other things that we're looking for, um, prior to that ball being kicked, meaning K staying on sides, uh, not being deeper than five yards from K's restraining line. We're gonna go to a zone coverage. And that zone coverage for us is cutting the field into, uh, into thirds. We're responsible basically from the 40 yard line or from where the ball's kicked and typically 25 to 30 yards from that, which is gonna put us at somewhere around the 30 yard line, give or take five yards. We're looking in the middle of the field and we're gonna observe action in the middle of the field as it makes its way back towards us. So again, come off the sideline, find yourself a position somewhere between the numbers and the hash, depending on where the ball's kicked. If it's kicked to your side of the field, I would stay closer to the numbers. If it's kicked away from you to the opposite side of the field, I would be closer to the hash, maybe even a little bit inside the hash. And if it's kicked directly down the center of the field, then I find somewhere between the numbers and the hash. Let's watch some film, uh, some actually some NFL games. And let's take a look at this first clip. Let it play for a second. So here, this is an NFL umpire's training video. Our umpire straddling his free kick line. He's got his back foot on the free kick line. He's got his forward foot about a yard in front of him. You know, that for me is uh, the mechanic I like to use. If you want to straddle the free kick line, then that's okay as well. There's not a, a hard mechanic that says one is better than the other. Uh, we'll have some leniency on free kicks that are going downfield to whether they are on sides or if somebody's off sides. Again, give them about a half a yard on kicks that are um, on side kicks, no leniency whatsoever. So in this film right here, again, we have a clean kick. Everybody's on side and they're showing the umpire where they want him to get down to about the 50 yard line. For us, it's gonna be the same. We're gonna start at the 40, but we wanna make our way down about 10 yards and find ourselves somewhere to park right about the 50 yard line. All right, remember free kicks. Free kicks, let's make sure we have a legal free kick. What do we need to have a legal free kick? 
touch the ground, go more than 10 yards. Um, as an umpire, I'm going to watch from the kicker to my side of the field to make sure nobody is all sides. And I'm not going to give any type of grace. Um, they cannot be past the plane of the free kick line. After that, depending on which way the ball's kicked, we're either looking at blocks or ball. You can see right here, there's not a lot that's going to happen in the center of the field. Once we determine if we have a legal free kick, make sure everybody stays on sides, then you divert your attention to the play closest to you and officiate the blocks and the action around the ball. see over there, not a lot of action on that side of the field. They're pursuing, but all the action is on the, the near side of the field, all the blocks and everything. What we don't have right here is we don't have not one official who winds the clock on this play. All right, earlier I said we're going to give some leniency to kicks that make their way down the field. Yeah, in this video right here, it looks like we had a penalty and now we're kicking off from the 20 yard line. Um, if not a penalty, it looks like this may be a, um, a, a free kick of some sort um, where we had a safety. And that's probably what this is. But once we watch this clip, again, let's assume this was a safety. They're kicking off from the 20 yard line. Unless there's somebody that is just egregiously off sides, we're going to let this go. This is not a free kick, or not a, uh, an onside kick, excuse me. So unless they are off by a step or two, in this case they called this on this team for being off sides, um, I'd let this one go. All right, let's talk about goal line mechanics really nothing that's changed in goal line mechanics. They're going to change the wording a little bit on goal line mechanics going out from the goal line. But in watching film last year, we noticed that as umpires, we have the opportunity to, to really get better when we talk about goal line mechanics. Well, goal line mechanics, you know, when do goal line mechanics start? Going in, they usually start at the seven yard line. Going out, they're going to start at the three yard line. Remember, our wings have a, a lot of additional responsibilities, whether we're talking about going in or going out. Okay, uh, there's a role reversal where we, we assume some of the responsibilities of the line judge and, and many times of the linesman. Let's talk a little bit about those role reversal responsibilities. So here we got a clip straight from our seven man mechanics manual. We're set up going in, have an offensive team that's trying to score. Uh, in this pictogram, mechanogram, they are starting from roughly about the four yard line going in. So we know since we're at the seven yard line or in that one of our first moves for our wings is going to be to the goal line. Okay. Goal line is the most important line unless there's a line to gain that's at maybe the two or three yard line, but they're going to make a move to the goal line. So what's that mean for us? Well, now we have a responsibility for ineligibles downfield where the ball's thrown from to make sure that that quarterback, that passer has not gone beyond the line of scrimmage. And also we need to see if on like swing passes where the ball's caught. Is it caught behind the line of scrimmage or beyond the line of scrimmage? Again, there could be penalties enforced if that ball is thrown beyond the line of scrimmage and we have ineligibles downfield. 
but we also could have penalties that are waved off or not called if that pass is caught behind the line of scrimmage with those linemen downfield. In addition to that, we need to pay attention to where we start in position uh, in relationship to the goal line. Remember, those wings are trying to make a call. Is that ball across the plane? And if we set up or if we move ourselves to the goal line, we may obstruct their vision. They might not be able to make that call. So remember, when we're talking about um, goal line mechanics, let's start in, in the end zone somewhere. Probably, you know, at least a yard, if not two yards inside the end zone. So what else are we looking for? Again, we're trying to read this play. We read a run, hold ground, try to pick up the runner, see which direction he's going, left, right, is he trying to bounce to the outside, or is he trying to come right down the middle? Comes right down the middle, and the play ends close to the goal line, then you're there to help support our wings, whether you have that ball in the end zone or not. Hands to the chest. Again, we're not saying he scored. All we're telling those wings is we have a ball in the end zone, and it's up to them to decide whether he made it in before he went down. Well, what if you read pass? If we read a pass play on goal line mechanics, we probably need to make our way towards the line of scrimmage, especially if we're talking about starting at the seven, six, or five-yard line. Um, I'd be a little bit quicker to get to the line of scrimmage, kind of our old mechanics where we used to go to the line of scrimmage. Again, we've got to watch for an eligible downfield. You need to take a look at which way that quarterback's moving. Is he going to the left or the right? And if he does go to the left or the right, I'm probably going to move with him and go towards the line of scrimmage in the same direction because I want to see when he throws that ball and make sure it's a legal throw from behind the line of scrimmage. And then if he does a little dump pass or something, I need to know where that pass is caught. So again, remember, don't camp out on the goal line. Read runner pass. Make the necessary adjustments after you read runner pass and be there on pass plays to help support the wings um, for an eligible downfield, amongst other things. What about these reverse goal line mechanics? Reverse goal line mechanics really start at the three yard line back to the goal line and stuff. So our wings are going to make their way back to the goal line and work their way back out. So it's not as critical for us to make our way up to the line of scrimmage. But remember, our wings may or may not be in position to make the call on an eligible's downfield. They have other things that they're concentrating on. And then in addition, whether that pass is thrown behind or beyond the line of scrimmage and where it's caught. So work with your crewmates um, to come up with a plan and officiate this and determine who needs to make those calls. All right, as we start to wrap this up, just wanted to spend a few minutes. Again, we, um, we're working football in a, a different time, day, and age, that of the COVID-19 coronavirus. I want everybody to, to be safe, to officiate smart on the field. And we need to take into consideration all the things that are centered around coronavirus. So when we look at our mechanics and trying to work that 40 second clock, um, some things may change this year. But I do want to remind everybody, you know, we're the pace setters on the field. Uh, whether we're talking about teams that are predominantly run or predominantly pass, uh, we still have the responsibility of getting that ball back out uh, to the spot where it will be next to be snapped and getting our crew in position and have everybody ready to go for that following play. So 
Remember, hustle. We're always hustling as umpires. Don't let anybody ever tell you anything different. Hustle, hustle, hustle. But don't be too fast where you don't think about your crew members. Because again, uh, plays that conclude in the center of the field, you may be able to spot that ball within a second or two. But make sure your, your deep officials and your wings have time to do the responsibilities during that dead ball period that they need to do. Well, let's talk about coronavirus and let's talk about being smart, smart management out there on the field. You know, in the past, we would try to um, manage that ball really through us as officials, bringing balls on and off the field. Well, we might want to reconsider how we work balls on and off the field. We may want to consider allowing ball boys to bring that ball directly out to us. Uh, what I'm going to look at is ways to minimize the number of players and or officials and or ball boys that have contact with that ball. So I know for me, when I think about plays that conclude on the field of play that I feel are close enough for me, I'm gonna go try to retrieve that ball from that player. I'm gonna have a conversation with those run, the running backs and tell them, hey, you know, if you're close to me, get that ball to me. Um, and that way, at least we only have a few players, a center, a quarterback, a running back, and me touching that ball on that play. So, then I think about, well, how often are we going to change balls out? You know, I'm going to try to play with the same ball as much as possible. Yes, there's times where we're going to have pass plays that go down the field, and it's just going to make the best sense for us to get a new ball from a ball boy and bring it in from the sidelines. And there's going to be times that uh, heat and humidity are going to play a factor, and that ball is going to be wet, and we're going to need to get a new dry ball. Um, rain can come into play at times and we'll need a new dry ball. But I want you to really think about how we minimize uh, contact with that ball. Um, you know, that's the one thing that we kind of can manage out on the field and it might be a, uh, a determining factor of uh, minimizing the passing of the virus. Again, Hustle out there, don't rush. Try to have ball boys, one with a wing, one with a deep, uh, in, in your best case scenarios. Have good pre-games with your counterparts and how you're gonna manage the balls and with the ball boys.